Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. I'm your host, Dr. Alan. Delighted that you've joined us today. Are you a busy professional, passionate about the work of your calling, yet realize that even though you love what you are doing, you're exchanging your time for money? You know that if you were to lose the ability to exchange time for money, your financial well-being will be in jeopardy. If you can relate, I have great news. Steve Tucker Capital is an investment company designed for professionals to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Remove the anxiety of an uncertain financial future and go to steetalker.com. Get your free one-page 10-step guide to passive real estate investing. Enlightened investors, the real estate industry is replete with one-off operators who then pose as the latest and greatest guru of the moment. There is no concern for that with today's guest who can authoritatively show us how to consistently make money in real estate. As he states, anyone can do that once. Ken Gee is the founder and managing partner of KRI Partners and the KRI Group of Companies. He is a certified public accountant and has more than 24 years of significant real estate, banking, private equity transactions, and principal investing experience. I cannot wait to pick Ken's brain and delve deep into the depth of his wealth of industry experience. Before we go there, Ken, share a memorable experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person that you are today. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this very much. So my formative years, when you think of formative years, you usually think of your very early years, right? Your adolescent years. But in my case, I think the most important part of my life was when I realized that I am where I am because I had chosen to be there. So what I mean by that is, as you said, I was a CPA. I spent seven years at Deloitte. I was five years as a commercial lender. I was working really, really hard. And I was learning an enormous amount, but I was always working for someone else, just what I was doing. And then at some point, I realized that all my clients for both firms, actually, were heavily invested in real estate, doing very well and building a very good life for themselves and a very interesting profession and a company. So I made the leap at some point many, many years ago. And since that time, so here's the formative part. Since that time, I have realized that where I am is really just limited on where my mind thinks that I should be and where I can be. And that's really interesting because prior to that, I didn't understand that. And I was where I was because I just didn't understand that I could be so much different, so much more further along with all of my goals than I was. So it's that realization that was really important to me and it really helped shape my life and has since then. Well, I can relate with that, Ken, as I lived with a lot of very limiting beliefs and I had a real, I often call it my road to Damascus moment because it was quite that dramatic and I was about 38 years of age and it was like the weights on my eyelids were lifted and I just started seeing myself in a very, very different way than I had prior to that time and my life changed in many, many wonderful, wonderful ways. It was a horrible experience to go through, but I look back on it and go, the worst day of my life was the best day of my life. Yeah, fun at times and challenging at times, but I believe that because I've gone through that process, and I still continue to go through that process today because we continue to limit ourselves, right? Our mind is just sort of seems like it's built that way. And the more we can figure out how to push those limits, the I am personally shocked at what we can really accomplish if we just allow ourselves to do that. So there you go. That's the life-changing moment, so to speak, for me. Absolutely. If we don't continue to grow, we just stagnate. And it has to be intentional. And that's what I thought for a while after that moment that I was done, you know. (laughs) But I soon learned that continuous process and it has to be intentional or we do stack. 
Well, Ken, I am so glad to have you on the show with us today because you just have such a depth of experience and from those experiences has come a wealth of knowledge. And I'm sure that we couldn't cover everything that you have to share with us in 100 episodes. So let's just try to stick with the basics a little bit today and go from the basics because as a CPA, I think you can really help us to have a really good understanding of those important basics to the business of real estate. And as you state, anyone can, by luck and by golly, can at least one time have a successful real estate outcome. But to do it over the long term, we do have to have a comprehensive and deep understanding of those basics. So start with that. From your perspective of that accounting background, as well as your experience as the CEO of a company leading some 50, 60 or so individuals. Sure. So I would say there's four things that I like to really focus on when I talk with people about how to really consistently make money in this business. Some of it's accounting related, some of it's not, but it has to do with more with business concepts. And after we talk about this, you'll kind of realize that it's kind of common sense. So I'm going to talk about value creation. I'm going to talk about leverage. and I'm going to talk about cap rates in general. So those four concepts are really, really important for us to understand in order to do this on an ongoing basis. So let's start with supply and demand. And I'm always going to try to relate it to my own experience of what we're currently doing and what we have done in the past. So just about everything in business starts off with supply and demand. So even a basic economics course, you don't need to be an economist to know this, but think about supply and demand. In our world, if I have demand, like we operate primarily in central and northern Florida. So in that market, about a thousand people move into that market every day. That's net in migration, and that's per the U.S. Census. We don't have good numbers after the pandemic, but I can tell you because we're on the ground every day, it's higher than that now. I just don't know what the numbers are because it hasn't been published. So if you think about what kind of people those are that are moving to Florida, some of those people are probably wealthy. Some of those are probably not wealthy, right? They're just normal people. So we guesstimate that maybe 25% of those people are wealthy and 75% of those are not, that's important distinction to know about the demand in that market that we're in. Now, you should relate it to whatever market you're in and you want to understand it. What's really critical is that you have increasing demand for your product. This is true of real estate, but anything for that matter. Now, When we think of central and northern Florida, the number one thing people say to me is, Ken, people are building like crazy there. Why on earth would you think that that's a good idea to buy there? Well, they are building, but they're building A-class properties because that's all they can afford to build. They cannot afford to build the lower price stuff. So they have to get rents of three, four, five thousand a month to support these highly amenitized, really, really nice resort-like properties. So they're servicing, remember I said the demand, we bifurcated the demand and the higher income folks and then just the normal people, they're servicing that higher income people. But that's only about 25% of that demand. They're not servicing the 75% of the demand. It's just not. And that's why we buy BC class properties, by the way, because they're not building them. So we're in a situation where we have stable supply. It's not no significant addition to supply. We have increasing demand. What's going to happen with rents? The economics of that situation, that's how you define a bull market, right? More demand than you have supply. Simple. Now, as a firm, we focus on value add. We'll talk about that in a minute, value creation, but we focus on value add. So when you're able to find a property that you can add value to and you're in a bull market, you've layered two things on top of each other that literally have a layering effect and you can just get crazy returns because of that. So number one thing I want people to focus on Before you even figure out what you want to do or where you want to buy, focus on these demand supply issues because those are really, really important. Now, our company initially grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and our back office is still in Cleveland, Ohio. The demand supply picture there is a little bit different, right? You don't have this crazy demand that you have in central and northern Florida. So as a result, you can still invest in Cleveland, but you have to do it differently and you have to make sure that you go in at the right price. Whereas in Florida, you have a little more 
in growing markets, you have a little bit more leeway because you'll earn your way out of a mistake, so to speak. But in markets where you don't have that demand supply setup, you got to be very, very careful. I'm not suggesting you don't invest there. I'm just suggesting that you be much more careful about how you buy there. So the first thing that I would talk about, and that's demand supply. The second thing I would talk about, and again, most of what I'm talking about here is going to apply to any business, not just real estate. But when you see the one thing I hadn't mentioned is that most people, when they think of getting into real estate, they equate that to being in business, which is, I never understood that because we're in a part, we buy and operate apartments. It just happens to be a business. It just happens to be apartments. So in any business, the number one thing that you have to do is you have to somehow create value. You have to somehow add value to the world in some way, shape, or form. If you have a product, you have to solve a problem, right? We have a product, it's apartments. What's the problem that we solve? Well, we're taking a property that isn't as nice as it could be, making improvements to it, running it better, making it a much nicer place to live. That's our value creation. And I would encourage you to find a way to make sure that your properties and your projects add value in some way, shape, or form. It wouldn't be the first time that someone has come to us and, and we're looking at their property and their project. And I asked them, okay, so how are you going to make money on this deal? What's your plan? And sometimes their plan is, well, I'm just investing in real estate because I know it's going to go up. And they don't really understand how they're going to create that value. So what I want your listeners to focus on, Alan, is that You've got to understand how you're going to add value to that property. Just make sure you have a plan and make sure it's well thought out. So that's value creation. That's number two, right? Number three is leverage. Now, the reason I talk about leverage here is because you have to be careful with leverage. You can overuse it. You have to manage it carefully. For example, you know, we started back in 1997. So that means I had the pleasure of going through the 09 recession, which was an incredible learning experience. But the number one thing that really sank a lot of really good people in this business during that time was debt management. Their loans happened to have matured at the wrong time. Nobody would refinance them, even though they were cash flowing properties, they were in wonderful parts of town. They made sense, the longtime customer of the bank, but it just so happened. And again, this is very difficult to predict, right? The banks just said no. I mean, that's just the way it was because the regulator said they had to get the real estate off their books. So that's what they did. So a lot of good people lost their buildings because of not being careful with debt. So now what did I take away from that? When you're placing debt on a property, number one, don't over leverage it. Please don't over leverage it because you just don't know what's around the corner. And number two, manage your debt maturities and give yourself out. Give yourself a way out. Give yourself a way to ride out a temporary hiccup, right? A pandemic, so to speak, or a financial recession. The market's going to come back because in our world, everybody needs a place to live. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So we know the market's going to come back. We just have to make sure that we set up our capital stacks so that it can survive that process. Enlightened investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success. So please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe and you can unsubscribe at any time. And then probably the last thing I would say about debt and leverage is make sure that you don't put debt in place that makes it so you can't sell your property when you want to sell it. Right. So a typical Fannie or Freddie loan, there's a yield maintenance penalty, a defeasance clause into it. Some of those. And people are right now, as we speak, stuck in these properties. They would love to sell them, but they can't because they have massive, massive prepayment penalties. And I'm not talking about small ones. I'm talking about a $2 million prepayment penalty and a $5 million loan. So they're stuck, right? So we're always careful to figure out how can I get out of this? And if it means using a hybrid product where it's fixed for a period, then goes floating, or even use a float, a straight floating product, but buy a rate cap so you're protected, right? Rate caps can expire. Doesn't mean you have to refinance it. So 
look at your debt very carefully because over the long run, right, you can always get lucky once or twice, but over the long run, something's going to catch up to you and you need to make sure that your debt puts you in a good spot to not make it difficult for you to refinance and make it so that you can sell whenever you really want to sell. This question of loans coming due and banks not willing to refinance even on properties that are managed correctly and that are cash flowing. What can an operator do? I mean, generally speaking, you're going to go into these properties with anywhere from 75 to 85 percent of leverage. And we rely on the institutions to finance that other 75 to 80 percent. Mm-hmm. And we can predict the future. I mean, we have lots yeah, of you never know what's going to happen, happen right. but you never know what's going to happen. And so <clears throat> loans are always going to come due. How can you manage through a crisis like that? Sure. So that's a really good question. So what's important is that you understand that it's a risk and you have to do everything you can to mitigate it. I don't think you can completely eliminate the risk, but you can certainly do things to mitigate it. For example, I am a huge fan of a longer term loan. 10 or 12 years, they'll even let you float that 10 or 12 year loan. So what does that do for me? It gives me the ability to sell when I want because you don't have massive prepayment penalties on floating rate loans. You just don't, number one. Number two, all right, so if I'm now in a floater, I'm worried about the risk, right? What if rates go up? Now I'm going to be in trouble. I won't suddenly won't be able to make my mortgage. That's why you'd either use a rent interest rate swap or some sort of rate cap that you can buy that would cap the rate so that your sensitivity analysis, you know what you can afford. And so you can define the term of that rate cap to coincide with what you think is going to be the hold period. So that at the end of the day, think about what happens to interest rates generally when the economy is struggling. Rates generally don't go up. Rates generally go down. So what's important is you're just not in a situation where the loan's maturing at the wrong time. So I like to use longer term loans with some floating component so that I don't have to refinance it. I don't really intend to use the floating period, but if it's there, if I need it, and if the economy is going like gangbusters, well, then rates might be up. But if the economy is going like gangbusters, well, my property probably is too. So that might be an okay time to sell that or refinance it or do whatever. So all I'm trying to do here is to give myself as much flexibility as possible while also protecting against rate increases. Now, you had talked about leverage amounts of 75 to 85%. I will tell you that we generally don't go over 75. We just don't. Can I prop up investor returns by going to 85? I can. Typically right now, the only lenders that will do that are bridge lenders. They'll do a lot of that. My concern, there's nothing wrong with bridge debt. The problem is if you look carefully, bridge debt is very short term. It's designed to give you time to turn around the property. But if something goes wrong, look at what happens to that bridge loan. They'll stick it out with you, but you will pay a very, very heavy price for them staying in the deal longer than they wanted to. That's part of how they make money. So I would say use that higher leverage just really carefully. See, over the years, what you'll find is I've just become very conservative and I would rather have a little bit lower investor returns and know that I can sleep easier at night knowing that I don't have this short-term debt coming due that if I don't get it paid off, then I have a problem. I'm not saying you shouldn't use bridge debt. You just have to be really careful with it and make sure you model out your worst case scenarios so that you know that you can survive those periods. That's what's important. Yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying that. So anything else there on leverage or are you going to go on? Yeah, no, I was, I was going to get a little bit into the cap rates. Okay. And I can talk for an hour on cap rates. Cap rates are something that over the 20 plus years I've been doing this, it's interesting to my beliefs on cap rates and my understanding of them has changed significantly. So when you think about cap rates, first of all, the most obvious thing is you need to plan when you do your modeling on your potential investment, you need to plan for a rising interest rate environment, especially now. I'm hard pressed to think that rates are going to go lower. Say that they do, but lower rates are not a problem. I'm not worried about those. I want to use terminal cap rates. That's the cap rate on exit or also referred to as an exit cap rate. There's a lot of different ways, reversionary cap rate. You can call it a lot of different things, but we do our modeling so that for buying at a five, what happens if it goes to a six and a half or a 7% cap rate? What does the exit look like? Are we still going to make money? So that's the number one thing I want to say about cap rates. 
make sure that you don't fall into that trick of keeping your cap rate constant and think that it's not going to change. It might not, right? There's a lot of people that believe that rates really aren't going anywhere anytime soon. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. It's a belief, right, that we don't really know. So what I want to do is make sure that if we're going to go into a deal, we understand what's going to happen if rates move, what happens to that sale price, what happens to that potential refinance. Now, if you want to dive deeper into cap rates, we can and talk about mechanically what is a cap rate. And here's the CPA and the lender in me. You can think of cap rates as the weighted average cost of capital because that's what it is, right? When you look at a capital stack, it's generally two pieces, debt and equity. And each of those two parties has their own return requirements, right? So let's say, I'm just going to be hard for me to do an example on the fly, but your debt, if it's 75% of your deal and they want a 4% return on their money and your equity is 25% of the deal and they want a 10% return on their money, you need to do the weighted average of those to mechanically calculate or mathematically calculate a cap rate. Now, the part where people get a little confused about is that equity piece, right? That equity investor typically is going to adjust their return requirement based on their expectation of the risk, right? Is it a tougher neighborhood? Is it a better neighborhood? Is it a growing neighborhood? Is it not a growing neighborhood? Is it a deal that we're planning on buying for cash flow? So there's a lot of subjective factors that go into that equity holders requirement for a return, right? In our deals, we're looking for an overall across the five-year hold period, we want a 15% annual return. That's what we're targeting when we do our analysis. So in our world, we can kind of back into what we think the cap rate should be based on what our debt's going to be and what we know we're trying to accomplish, right? So the takeaway here on cap rates is to sort of understand from a mathematical standpoint, what they are and what they represent. And then secondly, make sure that when you're doing your modeling, that you're accounting for sort of a worst case scenario. And that is a rising interest rate environment. Because if you're not careful, you could buy at a five cap, do nothing to the property. The cash flow is exactly as it was. Find yourself in a higher interest rate environment. Now you sell at a cap rate of seven and you will actually lose money. You've done nothing wrong. You've done nothing right. But, you know, it's exactly what it was when you bought it. If you think about that, just because now they're applying a seven cap instead of a five cap, you're losing money. So those are things that you just have to understand. So in our world, our value add world, that's why I like value add, because I can add more value that compensates for that potential increase in cap rates. That's why I love value add investing. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So what I'm understanding is that interest rates and the cap rate tend to follow one another. I guess it's the cap rate is going to follow the interest rate. So if interest rates go up, it's very likely that cap rates are going to follow that. Is it that may, as correct? long as the equity holders portion, their return requirement hasn't changed. Right. So what happens, especially in central and northern Florida, interesting things happen because people invest their money in Florida, sometimes for different reasons. Some of the money that comes into the state actually comes in from foreign sources. Well, they're actually looking at investing in the United States because relative to their home country, they deem it to be far more stable than where it is currently. So they, that equity holder might have a very, very low return requirement. They just don't want to lose money on their money, right? Mm -hmm. So think about that, right? So there's a lot of things that come into play. What's important is, yes, that you understand what's going on and you understand that a rising cap rate environment, you just got to know where you're going to exit it and how it's going to impact your value. So if you were able to keep the equity component constant, then you're correct. Loans, rising interest rate environment for debt is going to result in an increased cap rate on the sale of your property. Absolutely. And that's why we're doing those sensitivity analysis when we buy now. Yeah. I'm not comprehending what the equity stack really has to do with cap rates, because from my perspective, cap rates is kind of an external factor that is driven by market rather than the equity stack. So can you explain that to me? Or am I just sure. too dense to comprehend that? No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Not at all. So cap rates are market driven, but what drives the market? So in central Florida right now, Cap rates are relatively low. Why? Because lots of people 
want to invest in the state because of the growth, right? It's kind of similar. I am not a stock market expert, but people will be willing to pay a higher multiple of earnings. They'll be willing to pay more for a stock if they think that stock is going to grow, right? That's the way it is. In markets like Florida, they expect it to grow. So they're willing to pay and return less currently because they know that they're going to earn more later. So when you define the market, you're right. Cap rates are defined by market, but the market is determined in part by what the lenders will charge for their share of the capital. And the people that buy these properties, if there was no one that wanted to buy in the state of Florida, I guarantee you cap rates would go up in Florida. Why? Because it's market driven, right? There's less demand. As it goes back to a demand supply issue. If there's less demand, then it's easier for equity investors to want more return on their investment. When it's a very competitive environment, but they really want in, they're going to reduce their return requirement because otherwise they can't be competitive with the guy or gal next door who also wants in and they're willing to pay more for that growth. We're both right. It's very market driven. We're just talking about the psyche of an equity investor that kind of busts. The debt markets are where they are. But if rates go for right now, that you could probably get three, low threes. But if the debt markets change and you can, the best you can do is low fives, when you pencil out a deal and you can't make your debt service, guess what? You have to pay less. So interest rates going up, they force cap rates up. Because otherwise, you're below a 1.0 debt service coverage ratio, and the lenders won't let you do that. Well, they did in 08, 09, which is part of the problem, but they don't do that now. So you're correct that it's market-driven, but I'm telling you that it's market-driven because the people in the market are having an expectation for equity returns, and they're willing to move those. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. What I had misunderstood was I thought that you were saying that once they were in the deal, the equity investors were determining cap rate. But what I think you were actually implying is that the equity investors are driving the purchase market, which is what Mm -hmm. is going to affect those cap rates. Yep. Well, thank you for your patience with me and explaining that. So this has been very interesting and helpful in pulling all of those basic fundamentals together. So... Can you sum all of that up for us? The supply, demand, value creation, leverage, and cap rates. Pull all of that together. How is that going to affect our passive investors? If you're talking about specifically passive investors, here's what's important for passive investors to know. And this is what I try to tell everybody. Number one, stay focused on vetting your sponsors, your fund managers. Make sure that they understand these concepts Make sure that they have the experience necessary to lead the business that you're about to invest in through whatever is around the corner that you don't know, right? That's the number one thing. So vetting sponsors is something that passive investors really struggle with. I will share this with you. I have nothing to do with this company other than they vetted us. There's a company out there called Veravest. Not sure if you've ever heard of it. Veravest is a company that exists. They actually are filling a hole in this private equity market that is sorely needed, in my opinion. Passive investors don't have an easy way to vet sponsors like us, right? We've been around for 23 years. We've done 15 deals. I've got gobs and gobs of stuff if they want to look at it. But nobody wants to go through three, 400 pages and figure out, did I really tell the truth? Did I not? Is my track record accurate? That's what Veravest does. Pay them a lot of money. They come in. We send them 23 years of tax returns, settlement statements, operating agreements, and they do criminal background checks on all of us. And they monitor us going forward. So when our existing fund, they have our operating agreement. When we do something, they look and say, okay, Ken, what'd you do? You distributed money. Is it consistent with what the operating agreement says you're going to do? Yes, it is. They're monitoring us. So again, I have nothing to do with Veravest, but the reason I bring them up is I think they bring an incredible resource to the passive investor world that didn't previously exist. Maybe there's someone else doing it. I don't know. I've not heard of anybody, but this gives them at least the comfort that someone is looking over our shoulders and making sure that what we are telling you where we've done and are doing We've actually done it and it's actually been verified. So verivest.com, we're on that site. I would encourage all any passive investor to go there and check out that sponsor to see if they've been vetted, so to speak, right? 
or they can do it themselves. It's just an enormous amount of work, and most people don't want to do that. And a lot of people don't have the expertise because they're not CPAs and been trained in audit procedures and things like that. So for your passive investors, number one, vet your sponsors. Number two, make sure they have the experience that you think they should have to understand the four concepts that I talked about. I mean, these are very fundamental concepts, but you've got to understand them in order to make sure that they're buying properties that make sense right? It just does. And the more, you know, we talk to passive investors every day, and some of them are very smart, very sophisticated. And I love having conversations with them because they understand those concepts. And they're well equipped to figure out if I really do understand those concepts. And if you detect that they don't, then don't move on, move on. And experience is probably the last most important thing. Because like I said, three years ago, if you just said a pandemic was around the corner, I would have said, what's a pandemic, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So you have to have a management team there that can lead that business through whatever it might be, right? We can't mitigate the risk. These are businesses that are functioning and operating, but you want a management team that can figure out how to make changes necessary to be successful. So those are the three things I would say that I would like for your passive investors to really focus on. So vetting, experience, and number three was what? Number three was process, and that is go to a site like Verivest and see if the sponsor you're working with has been vetted. Okay. Very good, Ken. You have a very good way of explaining these concepts in an understandable way which clearly speaks to the wealth of experience you do have in this business and industry. Before we go into our last segment, what do you have to offer our viewers and listeners? Sure. So some time ago, I wrote a book. It's called, and this is really my belief, Multifamily Real Estate is a Total Game Changer. It's an ebook. You can get it by going to kripartners.com slash ebook and just give us your name and your email and you're able to get the link to download it. So this book does two things. One, I wrote it, every word of it myself, number one. Number two, it takes people, well, let me, the first part of the book talks about the question that every single real estate investor faces, right? So everybody knows that real estate has, there's a ton of money to be made in it, right? They're just trying to figure out how do they get their share? How do they fit into this real estate puzzle? Should they buy a single family? Should they buy a duplex? Should they buy an apartment building? Can they buy an apartment building? Should they invest passively? So I take them through that process. And I also look at the different asset classes within real estate, you know, medical, office, retail, all that, self-storage, all those kinds of things to try to help them sort of navigate that question, right? Now, most people, probably should be passive investors. So that's why the second part of the book is devoted to vetting sponsors. So I try to give you some in your viewers insight or your listeners insight into how does this business really work, right? What makes a fund manager or a syndicator tick so that you can understand their business model so that you can understand when their terms are investor friendly versus not? Do they seem fair? Do they not, right? Other than relying on what someone said, this guy is fair, this guy is not, you want to make your own determination. And so I give you some really good insights into how the business works and then just some guidance on how to vet, you know, what kind of questions to ask so that you can help identify. And of course, as you can well imagine, I preach the word experience because early on in our world, in my career, I didn't use other people's money. I used my own because I just don't think it's fair that I should learn on your dime. That's just not fair. And I encourage people to go with, you know, experienced fund managers and syndicators, because why do you want someone else to learn on your dime, right? That just doesn't make sense to me. So it's kripartners.com slash ebook. And the title of the book is Multifamily Real Estate is a Total Game Changer. You can build massive wealth as a passive investor. So I believe very strongly in that concept because I live it every day. And it's only a 30 or 40 page book. So it's a short read, but hopefully it helps add some value in some small way. Sounds like a great book backed up with not just knowledge, but with experience. Ken, share with us one of your most difficult setbacks in life and how did you come through that time and what did you learn from that experience? That's a really good question. So my most difficult setback was to professional. So probably the 08-09 recession 
was probably the most difficult time professionally. One, personally, I happened to have been going through a divorce at the time. That was certainly rough. But professionally, it was a time when, like I talked about, people, you know, there was a lot of consolidation in the business. People, rents were certainly not going up. At the time, we were doing most of our work in Cleveland. So a very different demand supply situation. Although Florida, well, it's Florida's a whole different story. It went crazy for a different reason. So the biggest challenge was trying to figure out how to run properties on an even skinnier budget because you had to, right? I always tell people, sometimes I do my best work when my back's against the wall. I don't know if you can relate to that, but you kind of do, right? In 08, 09, everybody's back was against the wall. In Cleveland, most of the properties in Cleveland, the owner pays for the heat. So if you remember back to that time, which you probably don't, this is a long time ago, the recession (laughs) came on the heels of really high gas prices. So when you're in a situation where you just got beat up with $16 per MCF gas prices, remember all the golf Gas refineries were shut in because of the hurricanes and everything else. I mean, it was a rough, rough time in the natural gas world before they started fracking and doing all the other things to find natural gas. So we just got through that process, and here came the 0809 recession. So when I say it's a setback, I, really it was a deferral, but it was a massive opportunity for me to learn and understand, okay, how do we really skinny these things down and run them extremely efficiently? See, I always believe that downturns, allow companies like ours to get rid of any fat in the company. There's no dead weight after that process because you can't afford to. And then as you come out of it, you're that much stronger for it. You know, you use the word setback. I'm a little hesitant to use that word, but I would say it was a setback, but it was also a massive learning opportunity. And are we far more successful today for having gone through that experience, you bet. You bet. If you look at any of our properties, even our third-party managed properties, we do things generally for a lot less than most people do because I went through that process and just wasting any money just is too painful for me to watch. So we just really hyper-focused on that. So that was a good question. Hopefully that is a good answer. Yeah, so that hard experience made you a better manager and really learned how to cut those expenses, which expenses are going to make and break real estate investing experiences. Absolutely. Well, Ken, imagine that you have come to the end of your life. And as you lay on your deathbed, what will you look back on with your greatest sense of joy and satisfaction? Yeah, that's a really good question. This really relates to my kids. When I sort of preach to my kids, I try to teach them that Above all, every single thing you do every day, I want you to imagine that you're looking in the mirror and your kids are standing next to you and you're explaining to them exactly what you are doing, what you're about to do, what you have done, and look yourself in the eye and say, you know what? I acted with the utmost integrity. I did the right thing. And never at any point did I compromise my integrity because It happened to be 08 and 09, and things were a little rough, right? We didn't start doing things that just were not okay. So as I look back at my life, hopefully I will feel like that all the things that I have done and the ways that I've tried to shape my children's lives and their beliefs, I've tried to instill that belief because I think that is the most important thing that we can do because by doing that, things that we do won't be internally focused, they will be externally focused, right? Because everything that we do will be for the betterment of everyone, not just ourselves. And I think that's really important. So that's what I hope that on my deathbed, when I look back, I can say that my kids understand what and why we did it. And they've adopted that same mentality, because I think that guiding principle in your life is super important. Because I believe that we're going to be far more successful because of that. I tell our people all the time, if I can't be successful with integrity and being transparent and open and honest with people, well, then I'll fail because I'm just not negotiating that. And, you know, I think people prefer to be around organizations like that. So I don't know, that's a long winded answer to your question. That is probably the number one thing that I would be able to say. Good question. Well, gosh, I wish you would spend some time with our politicians. (laughs) (laughs) 
If only looked in the mirror and asked that question, am I doing the right thing? I think we would live in a very different world. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Ken, thank you so much for being on the program. It has been a pleasure having you today. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital, a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at steedtalker.com.